Hello everyone. Uh, in this episode of Microeconomics on Instagram, I'm going to be talking about externalities. And before I get into talking about externalities, I want to take us back to stuff that we talked about in Unit 2. And we said in Unit 2 that markets have this special power associated with them, free markets. That they um, can be efficient ways of allocating resources, and they can be social welfare maximizing ways of allocating resources under certain conditions. And that's the important part, under certain conditions. Um, and then we found throughout this course, especially as we got into unit uh, four, when we were working with imperfectly competitive output markets, and then unit five, when we talked about the monopsony model, we found that markets, when you leave them to their own devices, sometimes fail. And what we mean by failure is that the market equilibrium doesn't maximize social welfare, right? Um, and the way that we think about social welfare and economics is consumer surplus plus producer surplus, right? We've gone over, this is all review. And so an externality is a type of market failure. It's a type of situation in which uh, social welfare is not maximized because there's going to be a gap between the socially optimal quantity of whatever the good is produced or consumed and the private, um, privately optimal quantity of the good that is produced and consumed. And so an externality reflects a situation in which the cost or benefit of a market transaction isn't just internalized by the parties, but it's actually absorbed and felt by other people external to the transaction that didn't consent to it. Um, it's externalized, right? That's where the term externality comes from. So it's a cost or benefit imposed on a third party that did not agree to incur the cost or the benefit. I know that sounds pretty complicated, but I think you all know what an externality is intuitively, or as Neville Longbottom's speech in the final episode or final uh, movie of Harry Potter in here. But um, um, so let's let's run through some examples. And so, in a conventional supply and demand graph, right? Assuming there's no market failure, assuming there's no externality, the demand curve is equal to the private marginal benefit curve and the social marginal benefit. Right, reflecting the additional benefit um, in dollars associated with consumption of that good. And the supply curve represents the, um, both the private marginal cost curve and the social marginal cost curve, um, marginal cost reflecting the additional cost associated with additional output, right? Um, however, with externalities, there's going to be a gap between either the private marginal cost and the social marginal cost, or the private marginal benefit or the social marginal benefit curves, okay? And the reason why we want to represent these things graphically is because graphs in economics can help us and they should be used as tools, right? They can tell us a more sophisticated story than prose could ever in the case of economics, right? And so here we have an example of an externality for like the market for steel. So we can imagine steel production, you know, we've done a lot about producer theories and we've talked about, you know, we expect increasing uh, marginal cost curves for firms, at least in the short, or actually in the short and long run, increasing marginal cost curves for an over, upward sloping supply curve uh, and a downward sloping demand curve, right? And that the price is set at the equilibrium, um, the allocatively efficient point, assuming perfect competition. Wow, that was way too much added information. Sorry about that. But in this example, we can see that uh, let's imagine in the process of steel production, this steel producer is dumping sludge down a river, right? And it's killing fish, it's killing, in, um, it's causing all sorts of environmental costs and economic costs on other people that didn't consent to this market transaction. They're not even participating in this transaction per se, aren't even necessarily buying the steel, but they're getting harmed by it, right? And so we can conceptualize a production externality as a gap between the supply curve and the market, which we'll call the private marginal cost curve, and the social marginal cost curve, which, you say, which we show here. Right? These costs, these environmental costs, um, which we'll think about as marginal damage, are not internalized or felt by the firm, or, um, and that they're externalized by other people. It's an externality. And then we can see that there's overproduction, right? Because we can let go all the way down to the x-axis and try to tell a story. We can see that at Q1, the private, the optimal or desirable quantity produced is higher than Q2, right? So we can actually think of it as creating deadweight loss, right? Leaving the market to its own devices, it fails because it creates deadweight loss or overproduction, right? From the socially optimal 
welfare maximizing quantity, which is if steel producers would just produce less steel. Then we have a negative consumption externality. We can think of it, consumption externalities, as a gap between the social marginal benefit curve and the private marginal benefit curve or the, the, the demand curve. Um, and we can see it here. Um, I don't want to go too much into these other externalities. I think I've already had a couple of Instagram posts, and I know Juliana's probably tired of pulling this up. Um, but I just want to talk about how to think about drawing dead weight loss. Um, so the dead weight loss triangle is always going to be pointed towards, the, the point is always going to be pointed towards the socially desirable outcome uh, to produce, right? So that's an easy way to kind of find the dead weight loss triangle, right? So socially desirable outcome in this example, and this positive production externality is here. In this example, it's here. So the point is always pointed towards that. Okay, we're done.